Today we'll be in continuing our series in the essence of God, and uh, this will be number three on sovereignty. And I thought about this for a little while. Of course, God always works out the details, but um, sovereignty as it relates to Jesus Christ, I think, is, is a good topic. And today, since it's Easter, and actually our communion service at Combined, we'll, we'll see how God's control and also how the free will of man come together at the cross. So it's, uh, I think it'd be a good study and um, God will guide us through it. So before we get started, uh, one of the unique things about, I think that we have as Christians is um, we are considered priests according to uh, the Bible and individual priests. It's a, you know, it's a church age thing. And one of the great responsibilities or the privileges, I feel, that comes with that is we can represent ourselves directly to God. That, that includes prayer. Um, and that, in, more importantly, includes um, confession of sin. You can go directly to God and confess. So that's important. And so we do that each and every uh, class, right before class. We just take a moment of silent prayer. And I give you time to confess your sins. And then... Uh, I'll say a prayer and we'll get started. So let's pray. Dear Father, we are beyond grateful for this day. We know every day is, uh, is by your grace and you give it to us to live and to come to an understanding of your plan for us. We know you have a purpose and we know that... Um, we're always trying to discover that purpose more and more each day to grow and understand who you are as our God. We thank you for everything. We thank you for this message, and we ask for clarity, ask for guidance in it so we can understand it better. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So, we, as I said, we're still talking about the sovereignty of God, and uh, we've been learning a few different aspects of the sovereignty of God. And if you remember, sovereignty is the over, I guess you could say, overarching control of God's plan, his authority, his control. Um, you know, as Christians, that has a big effect on our lives when we think about the details of life, when we think about how we don't have control. Um, if you ever try to plan a trip, you see how well it goes. Uh, we, we, we like to know the details, but a lot of times we don't have any control over the details. But God's plan shows us that he not only controls uh, the over the big picture, but he controls the details, too. And that can be a little confusing when you think about, well, wait a minute, I do have a free will decision that I can make in this process. And that's true. We do have a responsibility as Christians um, to not only come to a saving faith of accepting Christ as our Savior, but also continuing to grow in that plan after the point of salvation. So, yes, God is in control, but it doesn't take away your responsibility to move forward in that plan. And, you know, when you think about that, that's just the power of God. His plan and his means will still go to where they are meant to go as he desires, despite our rejection, despite our bad decisions, and despite anything that we may do to hinder that plan. Because remember, the plan, his plan can't be hindered, and it can't be um, you know, thwarted by evil. So, and you looked at some of those things. Some of the th things we saw that God is in control of in our lives is in the realm of blessings. Remember that study? We talked about blessings. Um, that's a, an interesting and fun topic. We all like blessings. But one of the things that we talked about was, I think the takeaway from that was that we shouldn't be focused on the blessings, but we should be focused on the blessor, which is God, right? If we keep that intact, keep that relationship intact, keep that growth pattern um, moving, consistent, God will provide the blessings. He, he's good at timing. He's perfect at timing. And he's also perfect with the content of your blessing. So uh, we always speculate and we always hope for certain blessings we have in our mind that we want. 
but God knows exactly what we need and when we need it. So it's to our advantage to focus on the giver, focus on where the blessings come from versus the actual blessing. The second area we looked at um, that included the sovereignty of God was your, how do you apply this to your life? I think, of course, blessings is one area, right? But to, I think to understand and to know by faith that God is in control is a big deal. You know, we can say it, we can talk about it, or we can do a lot of things, um, we can act it out that God is in control, but to truly know and understand and apply that to your life is a big time problem solver every day. Because we can wake up and know, okay, even though I don't know what's gonna happen, even though I don't know the details, I know who does. And if you can actually um, take that by faith, and it, it is God's word, right? That's what he tells us to do. Um, we can actually live in accordance and glorify him. Remember, glorifying God is living in such a way that is pleasing to him. It's all that means. So when we live in such a way where we're relaxed, we're content, we're not worried about the future, but we're relying on God. Um, that, I feel, is the application of God being in control of our lives. And he um, appreciates, he, he desires that. He uh, hopes that we all come to that understanding. And, you know, I always say that's a growth thing. You know, that's part of the Christian life, right? We, we have to know and grow and learn. I get it, you know, I'm with you. Um, so don't stop, keep going, keep growing, and it only gets better. You know, God has a funny way of, of giving us little bits and pieces of things as we move, and those bits and pieces are pieces of your happiness that you have in here, not out here. Because remember, out here won't ever make you happy. It has to be what's inside of you that makes you happy. So, um, so that was the, the, the second area that we looked at, and that was resting in faith, resting in your faith, knowing that God is in control. And so I think that's something you can use every day, right? That's application every day you can use. And then the third area we study was in reference to our free will. God has given us the ability to, to choose, which is pretty amazing, right? We're not robots. We're not, uh, he doesn't, um, he desires, but he doesn't force. So he's given you the responsibility to live in accordance with his plan or to not live in accordance with his, with his plan. Now, everybody's different in that area, right? We're all at different levels. We all have different levels of po how positive, how faithful we are, how much we want of that, how much we don't. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that at the end of the day, we still have the choices to make. And even though God is in full control, God is re uh, uh, responsible for the overarching plan, we're responsible for how much we partake in that plan, okay? That's a big deal. So, um, and that's just living the Christian way of life, right? Living, pleasing to God. So, and don't forget, of course, salvation. Coming to the point of salvation. That's the role of the believer, is to present the salvation, salvation message, to talk about it, to encourage others, so they can get to the point of maybe understanding who Christ is and actually believing uh, what he did for us at the cross. And so, so we definitely have a part to play. There's a huge responsibility when it comes to life itself, I feel like, you know, just living. Um, we get caught up in the details so easily. Uh, you know, we have families, we have jobs, we have uh, kids' events. That'll take up your time. We have, uh, you name it. I mean, uh, there's so many things that are God gives to bless, but at the same time, they can, they can, we can make them into distractions. They can become distractions in our life from the real source of those things that were given to us by God. 
So that's where we don't want to be. We don't want to be distracted by the details of life or distracted by even by people, right? Um, there's so, just so many things. I mean, you know, you go home, it's distracted, distraction after distraction, right? So just be careful. Um, and, and that's just in a day. Now think about your life. We don't want to look back and look back over a life of distractions. Did you have fun? Maybe, sometimes. But did it count for eternity? That, that's really what the issue is, right? We don't want to just live and not have anything to show for, uh, both on this earth, we're not happy, and blessings on this earth, and also in eternity. There's things that actually have meaning and purpose, and, and, and there's why we do these things, right? It, there, there is a reason for it. And I think most importantly, it's because God desires us to. And, and that's a big deal, right? We, we, des we should have his desire. And I think we come together on that. The more we learn, the more we grow. But you see, the, the, I think the point is it goes back to res the responsibility of each individual person here, including myself. Can't take myself out of this. So, um, and as you are aware, today is the day we celebrate and honor uh, what Jesus Christ did on the cross and uh, the fact that he defeated death is a good way to say it. You know, death is one of those things that we think about. You know, we have, um, it comes to our mind, you know, okay, this is timed. I'm on a time limit here. How long is God going to give me, right? There, there's things that come to our mind. But today is a day that... Um, to think about that God has provided a better option, right? To say that he has defeated death and that he offers that to us is groundbreaking. I mean, it's why we can live in such a way that is different from the person who has no hope, who has, uh, you know, thinks about the future and it's very dark maybe. You know, th there's no hope at the end of the road. It's like that guy I was telling you I talked to, I was like, well, what do you think happens when you die? He's like, you know, I think it just blacks out is what he told me. He goes, I think it's just, you know, game over. And I was, it, was, it was a young guy. I was like, maybe he plays a lot of video games. But that's really what he thought. He, he thought it was just power button off and then life was over. You know, that's a wake up call to people that have to die and go somewhere after that. And it's either going to be somewhere they really don't want to be or somewhere that you do want to be and you do desire to be. And that's the point of the resurrection is that death has been defeated there. You know, death is just a moment, you could say. So there's no reason for the Christian to be scared or to be fearful of a transition. Let's call it a transition because it really is just a second, right? It's a second. You may go through a process, of, a painful process maybe, but act, the actual death, that's just a blink of an eye. That's a transition to say bye-bye and hello, but we need to make sure that we know for certain where we're going. And God gives us that ability through Jesus Christ, through faith. He makes it very, very simple for us. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, For in Adam all die, so also in Christ also are all will be made alive. There's, there's a lot of verses that I went through, and a lot of them talk about all, everybody, uh, you know, um, which includes who? Everybody. God gave each and every person these benefits. He designed them for, specifically for everybody everyone. Now, whether we choose to receive or you could say accept is up to us, right? Goes right back to that responsibility thing. It all depends on how you want to live. You could say, do I want to be happy? Do I want to be fulfilled? Do I want to be content? And do I want to go and live for eternity? It seems pretty easy, doesn't it? Seems easy, but a lot of people don't want it. They don't desire it. They know it's there. They keep pushing it back because they're scared to confront something that maybe they may be fearful of. But look, 
death has been defeated. What is there to be afraid of is my question. Nothing, right? John 14, 19 says, because I live, you will live also. So I think today is kind of like the culmination of, you could say, of Jesus Christ's work on the cross, right? It's he lived for 33 years on this earth. He walked the earth for one reason, to eventually die and be resurrected. So today is that day that we celebrate that he was resurrected and that he did defeat death. You know, death couldn't hold him. And when you think about death or dying, you know, that is the real enemy of someone that hasn't accepted Christ as their savior. That's the fear. That's the enemy. That's the one who takes everything home at the end of the day. That's the game stopper, the power off button for them. See what I mean? It wins if you don't have something or someone that has defeated it and offers that to you. So there's the option. There's the option. And that's what Christ has given us. So we know that, um, of course, three days after um, Christ died on the cross, he was resurrected. He was found guilty, as you know, um, by and he was convicted of death by Roman crucifixion on a cross. Um, and so that's what led us up to this point, of course. And then at, before that, he was beaten before carrying his own cross um, to the point where we know that he died for our sins on the cross. So. Some people call this Easter and I, you know, I'm getting to the point where uh, and, and don't get me wrong. I, I was we celebrated Easter in my family when I was young and I don't necessarily see anything wrong with that as long as you understand the meaning of today, because I do think that Easter can also be a smokescreen for a lot of kids that just see the eggs, the candy and everything else and don't see the resurrection anywhere in that. And I think we can actually reverse that process, right? If Satan is designing one thing to do one thing, we can take it and grab it and flip it on him and say, no, this is what it means. This is what it means. It doesn't mean this, it means this. He does it, so why can't we, you know? So, uh, so by no means am I saying that I don't like chocolate <laughs> because I do. I like candy in general. I like probably all candy. Um, as you know, I just had a toothache for about two weeks. That's an indicator of how much I like candy. So, but there's a true significance um, of this. And if you're wondering if the Easter Bunny is related to Jesus Christ, I have to tell you, no, <laughs> it's not. But, you know, there's things about Easter that we need to start injecting the meaning of Christ into this day for just people in general, right? Because um, it can be overwhelming and it can be overwhelming to the point where you lose, you lose sight of the big picture of what, it, what it's really about. So just keep that in mind because as you know, I'm getting a little bit older and I'm starting to really examine all that Easter stuff. You know, it can be very distracting if you're not careful. And I'm not to the point where I'm the guy that uh, says the radio and the TV are the devil, but I'm, I'm getting there. You know, that's where it all comes through, right? So um, I just trust that we, you know, we have people that can discern, that can understand, that can know um, that we can still uh, enjoy something, but at the same time be locked into the true significance of it. So you don't have to throw away your chocolate Easter bunny because of me, that's for sure. So we know that um, part of that is you know that Satan is, the Bible calls him the ruler of this world. And not that he is the overarching ruler, we know that God is the ruler, right, of the universe. But he has left Satan here to try to disrupt, to try to cover up, 
to try to conceal, to do everything he can to cover the fact that there is an absolute truth. There is a word of God. There is a savior that has died for our spiritual death on the cross, right? He doesn't want you to know those things. And he doesn't want us to know what today meant. And that's why you have all this other stuff. Think about it. Christmas is the same exact way, isn't it? How does Santa Claus relate to the birth of Christ? I don't know. It doesn't. So we just have to know and navigate in such a way that, um, you know, just, we just have to understand. I think that's the biggest part of it. I mean, I was thinking about it even birthdays, you know. Uh, that's a day that God has graced us out with to put us on this earth, right? I mean, everything kind of gets covered up and, and thrown by the wayside. But so, but I think we're all aware of what today is, and it's a celebration that Christ defeated death. We could call it a celebration of life or victory over death day, if you want to. That's a good term. So I wanted to continue in this area and relate this to the sovereignty of God, the full control and authority of God in the sacrifice, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you remember, we left off with David's prayer. We got through David's prayer. He was giving thanks um, because it was such an overwhelming response that people were giving. It, you remember the supplies to build the temple and he was just overwhelmed. He's, he gave, then the people gave, and he, he recognized that these things come from God. He's like, everything the people gave, everything I gave, everything that I have, everything that they have, all originates from God, and they're just giving back to the source that gave it to them. He sees this, and he's, he, he just he couldn't believe it, so he prays, right? He was worshiping God. He's like, thank you, you know, for being such an uh, uh, overruling and powerful and gracious God. And we went through a lot of that. And he's referring, and part of the prayer is referring to the physical things. He, he recognizes that everything that we have as people, whether believer, whether unbeliever, whether accept or reject, everything that we have on this earth is because of God. And it's from God why he even gives us physical life and how he provides us with everything that we have on this earth to sustain us. How about life itself? You know, a heartbeat can stop beating at any moment. That's the sovereign control of God that I think David is recognizing. And he says, you know, uh, he, he basically, he's just so humbled and he, cause he understands that this is way beyond him, but he knows the source. He knows the source, and that's the important part, is the source of everything in life, where it comes from. Um, how about your abilities, your talents, who you are as a person, your personality? You know, God has given you a lot of things that many times we take credit for, but we really don't have any, that's not our area. That's not really not. God has given us these things to be able to function and to serve him in such a way that is pleasing and glorifying to him. And notice that each one of you have a gift. You all have a gift that God has given you specifically, plural on that, gifts that he's given you. So he wants to use these. And sometimes that gets lost in the shuffle, right? I mean, I know there's a lot of talented people here. Every one of you are talented but if you can relate that to be useful in the plan of God, think about how much more fulfilling that would be than using it and looking back and say, well, that was a distraction. That, what was that for? Well, maybe it was for a little financial gain, but did that really have any effect at the point you are transitioning from this earth to eternity? No. And that's why we want to have the maximum impact that we can while we're here. While we are on this earth, we need to have an impact. So I think that's the Christian's goal, right? So we saw that God's sovereignty, we could say that's a synonym for his rulership. 
is expressed in his absolute will or his desire, which we call the plan of God, the plan of God, the overarching plan of God. We also saw that nothing can resist or oppose his plan. And this is where it gets interesting because it's God's will and plan that happens through people. It happens through people. You know, we think about God's plan is going to happen no matter what, and it will. But it happens through people that make decisions. And that's a free will decision that we all make. So that tells me that there's always going to be someone that is a faithful believer that is going to push the pendulum forward when it comes to God's plan. There's always going to be a faithful believer. It might get down to eight people like it did in Noah and the flood. Remember, the whole world was corrupt. God said, I'm going to be done. I'm going to get rid of everyone and I'm going to start over. It was a reset, right? And he started over because there was only eight people that were faithful. And that's the reset. Not today's reset, right? That we talk about God's reset. It was God's reset. So, and, and what did Noah and his family do? They moved the plant, God's plan forward. And here we are. We all come from someone in that family. We come from Adam and Eve, right? And then we all come from someone in Noah's family. Here we are. So, you didn't know you were all related, did you? So, Free will is the issue today. And um, the fact that I think that we need to take these things into account because there's that goes back to that responsibility issue. And this reminded me of when I think about responsible, being responsible, making decisions that are responsible. Um, I was reminded of and, and also the free will aspect of this. We can choose one way or we can choose another. There may be things that influence you, but when it comes down to that very, that decision to say yes or no, it falls on us, right? That, that's part of the plan of God that he has designed it to be such, free will decisions. So now let's relate this to salvation. Salvation. We know that salvation was provided for all. Remember I kept telling you that, but there's, there's a flavor of a type of theology called Calvinist or some flavors of, of reform theology that view the salvation work as limited, as limited. And this came to mind and I think everyone knows about it, right? But we need to, we need to just throw it out there because it's one of those things that we need to be aware of that we've got a free will of mankind and we have the salvation work of Christ on the cross. Now, when we say that salvation work was only applied to certain people and it wasn't applied to other people, what does that do? Well, first of all, it removes the responsibility off some people. And the next thing it does is that it really goes against God's character. Isn't God perfect? Isn't he perfectly fair? Yes, he is because he's just. So. He provides it and he offers it, but he offers it to all. In other words, this life is designed to have equal opportunity to every Christian that comes to a point of saving faith. And if not, God takes care of the details in that area too. He always provides when something is lacking, right? He always provides. That's the fairness of God, his justice. So. So just keep this in mind that if we don't understand that God is in full control, yet man has a free will, responsible decision to make, you end up some, like something that's called limited atonement, which says Christ only died for certain individuals. See, we don't know the details of how God works his plan and how he controls and how powerful he is and why he does certain things. But we know that his word tells us that. So we can take that through faith. That's how we can believe these things that God is who he says he is. And his plan will move forward despite our decisions. 
and that Christ provided this, uh, our salvation to the world, right? So, um, and, and of course we have, we have verses on this. The only thing limited in salvation is those who limit themselves from it. That's a good way to say that. That's the only limiting thing about salvation. So whenever you talk to someone, there's, there's a lot of people out there that think they don't deserve salvation. And that is a complete lie. Not only to themselves, but from the scripture, from the word of God, what he tells us. No one deserves salvation. But the way they're taking it, they're taking it because the things they've done, they've done things that are bad enough that God can't save them. Well, guess what? None of us deserve salvation because why we were born into this world in a sinful body. So we needed somebody to come in and save us. We needed somebody to come in and step in and say, I will die for that sin problem that you have. And there you go. There's the mediator. That's where Christ comes in to the picture. And, 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 and we'll see. We'll, we'll talk about that. We're getting into a little bit more of this. But so really, this is kind of getting into the area of, of predestination. I don't want to get too off in the boonies with you on that. But um, we can't say that some are predest predestined to be saved and some are predestined to be condemned. OK, we can't we can't say that, but that's what the limited atonement view says. So as long as you know that each individual is responsible for where they spend eternity, I think is the most important thing. And God is still in total control. Um, but predestination says that he's in control and he already knew your decisions that you were going to make in eternity past. And he has provided by grace and facilitated for you to make those decisions and integrated them into his overall plan, whether they're for him or against him. And that's just the power and sovereignty of God. How can he do that? How can he do that? Well, I think we have a very good picture at the cross on how he did that, don't we? There was people that rejected. There was people that wanted to kill. There was people that denied. And all that was going into one purpose. One purpose. Evil was working towards God and humanity's good, you could say. So there was one purpose that that was working towards. And that just shows us how powerful, even despite things that oppose, completely oppose and reject and don't want any part of, God will use them for his good. It's interesting. Uh, you know, all this work that Satan is running around doing, obscuring, opposing, covering up, God will use all that, every single bit of it for his plan, for his plan. Doesn't make him responsible for those decisions. He's just using what that person has decided to do in evil or in wrong decisions and he's already put it in into his plan and he's working it towards his good so that i think is a is a picture of of how much control god has you know when in the human sense when you think someone opposes you or someone doesn't doesn't want to do something there's not much you can do about that right you can pray about it that's what you can do but I mean, from a physical, just a, let's say just a human standpoint, if someone doesn't want to do something, I mean, you could, you could maybe force them. But, you know, if it's what if it's an adult that you're trying to there's a business deal going on there. And then all of a sudden there, there's just something that happened. You can't make something happen. Right. You can't change the way the situation is because that's how the human natures work. But God can. That's the only person that can do that, that can change the direction something goes based on someone else's bad decisions. We can't. We're not we're not in that realm. So. And we have I just wanted to show you a bunch of these these verses that we have that talk about unlimited atonement. See, all you got to do is go to the scripture. 
every time if there's some false doctrine, some false misunderstanding, just go to the word and see, is it there? Is that what we're really, is that what my pastor, what's he talking about? Well, here you go. You see everything that is inclusive about everybody. Christ died for the, but also for the sins of the whole, not for us only, but also for the sins of the whole world, bringing salvation for all people. Um, God so loved the world. So there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of verses on this. You know, this isn't something that I can, you know, I, I can't conceal this, at least without it busting at the seams. Because you're going to eventually run into a verse that talks about everybody. So, so we see the Bible definitely teaches unlimited. It's unlimited. The entire human race is offered salvation. So, and then we have another verse. 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6 talks about this also. And I underline the alls there. Who desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So, um, so God's not going to force you to make a certain decision, even though he desires you to. That's the key concept here. Um, so God's ultimate authority, we could say, means that man has a responsibility to recognize that authority as salvation and also to continue to respond uh, throughout your life. And, and there's no, uh, I can't put that any other way, really. So 1 Timothy 2.4 says, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. And um, this has been on my mind, as you know, I put a little short video on it out there because there's too many people that stop at salvation. There's too many people that stop at salvation and don't continue that, that, you know, it's one thing to be saved, but it's another thing to realize what all that God has given you and that you are now a part of that you weren't a part of before you came to a point of saving faith. And that's the realization Think about the death of Christ. Is that not enough to motivate you to continue in this direction? It should be. You know, it should be. Because it's rooted in love. It's rooted in a desire that God wants to see you in a better place. And, and what's wrong with that? Is that a bad thing? Is that something to reject? Is that something to be miserable on this earth for? No, it's not. It's something to say, okay, I realize that God is wanting to see me in a better place spiritually, mentally, experientially, everything. But we have to want it. We have to desire it. And that's, um, I think, where it all, what it all boils down to. So our desire has to be lined up with God's desire. Or if it's not, what does that mean? Your life really has no purpose. You ever feel like, what's my purpose in life? Well, there you go. There you go. Your life won't have any purpose unless it has something to do in the spiritual realm. Unless you're desiring what God desires for you, your life will not have any purpose. And that's not fun. That, there's, you know, to not have any purpose means that you have no reason to continue to live is what that tells me. And when we get to that point, not only have we been deceived, Satan has somehow deceived us, but we have made the decisions and we are the ones that are responsible for the position that we're in. Everybody has purpose. God has a reason and a plan for each individual here. Everybody. Every event that happens in your life points back to God, whether it's to wake you up, whether it's to discipline you, whether it's to provide blessing. Nothing happens without a purpose. Everything has a purpose. The point that we need to realize is that are we responding properly to all these events in our lives? You know, it's it's not about 
the details. It's about the source of the details. Where are these things coming from? Right? We may be the cause of the discipline, but think about where the discipline is coming from. It's a divine intervention that is trying to get you back on track in your life. Things get hard. Things get tough. Things aren't easy in this life, right? It, but is it because of my own bad decisions? That's what we need to wake up to. Don't stay down the same trail if you know that you're doing something in a wrong way. You have to, you have to wake up at some point is what I'm getting at. You got to wake up. So the fact that God has already planned and it's desiring you to get with that plan, I think is exciting. I think that's a good thing. And so there is hope. There is um, a lot to look forward to. And there is purpose. There's big time purpose waiting for everybody here. And I, know, I realize, you know, a lot of you are already on board with that purpose, right? But maybe some of you aren't. I don't know, right? Maybe some of you aren't. And what I'm telling you is that it is waiting for each individual here to just drive forward and start having fun. I'm talking about having real fun in your life, in your marriage, in your relationship with other people. Because why? Because you're relying on God, not relying on the person. You're relying on God to uh, facilitate your life, to walk you through life and to help you and to provide you everything that you need to live a life that is, is really uh, definitely unique. Uh, that he's provided so but it shouldn't surprise you that it takes knowledge it takes the understanding it takes the the want to know god who is he who's this person that has provided all these things for me well we have you know here it is it, it tells us every detail doesn't it it does just have to have that desire to want to know about it And I think that's how we can get to 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. There is a lot to be thankful for. Um, actually, it says all circumstances. All. The good, the bad, the ugly the not so fun, all circumstances, like I just told you, have a purpose, have a purpose. And this says that if we are in tune with his plan, we can be thankful because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. That's big. That is big. You know, there's a lot of things you look at in your life and say, man, I, I'm not thankful for that. God has a purpose in it. He's got a purpose in it. He's got a reason why it's there and why it's happening. And when you get through it, when you look back on some things, you realize that, wow, that was meant for my growth. That was meant for to make me realize that God is in full control. Right. But it takes faith. It takes understanding. It goes back to knowing and, and being faithful as a believer. So um, as with everything else, that God desires from us, it, it requires us to replace our thinking with a different kind of thinking. Replace our thinking with his thinking. That's what aren't isn't that what we're commanded to do? To think with the mind of Christ. That's it. That's how he wants us to live. And he, he's given us a rule book on how to do that. He has. And, and, you know, really, technically, we could classify everything in our lives as blessings and something to be thankful for. So Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And why I wanted to emphasize free will so much in this first service is because in the second service, we're going to talk more about how. Uh, the free will of evil people, as I just mentioned, the free will of faithful people, 
the free will of Jesus Christ. Everybody thinks, oh, he just had to do that. He was a God, our God, and he was man in one, which meant he had to have a free will. He had to go to the cross willingly. And it was from love, we know, right? Rooted in love of how he got there. And then the overarching sovereignty of God. How did he take these things, all these different I want to do this, I don't want to do that, and get it to the point where he needed it to go. And that, that's um, what we'll talk about, is Christ's willingness to die on your behalf and how evil tried to oppose it, but actually did not at all. So, um, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for, thank you for your message. Thank you for everything that you do for us. We know that uh, the message isn't always, um, it's always effective. We know that it always applies somewhere to our lives, but it can be different for everybody. But that's the, the part of your word that's alive and active, is because it hits us in the soul and allows us to think about things that we wouldn't normally think about. And one of those things that I think it was brought up today is that salvation was provided to all. So if there's anyone here who has never thought about life after death or is ever fearful of that uh, moment, God has defeated death through Jesus Christ. And his word tells us that uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith that is not of ourselves, but it is a gift of God so that no one can boast. And a gift means that you just have to receive it. You just accept it by faith, belief. That's it. That's the, that's the message. That's the gift that he's provided. And so just take it, believe it, and it's yours. So we thank you for all these things, and we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.